Yo, Ben here. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to make your own DIY multi-sensor. It can detect light levels, temperature, humidity, motion, and has an RGB LED. There's no soldering, no coating. This is as easy as it gets. Let's finally get to it. So, first things first. In order to use this multi-sensor, you're gonna to need to have your own home automation hub that supports MQTT. If you've been around this channel before, then you know I love Home Assistant. It runs on a $35 Raspberry Pi, and if you've never checked it out before, then you definitely should, because it's awesome. It's free software, really easy to get set up, and it lets you get started automating tons of devices around your house in just a few minutes. Definitely check out my earlier video if you're looking to get started with that. The other thing you're gonna need to get started with this multi-sensor is an MQTT broker. If you don't know what MQTT is, no worries. I have an earlier video where I explain it in detail, but basically it's just a protocol that lets you send messages back and forth between devices really easily. Assuming you have your home automation hub set up and an MQTT broker, you're already halfway there. In the process of making this multi-sensor, I tested a lot of the all-in-one ESP8266 microcontrollers. I tested the Node MCU and all of the variants of that I could find, the Adafruit Huzzah, and the Wemo D1 Mini. While all of those microcontrollers worked, I landed on the Node MCU 1.0 because it's readily available, really cheap, has an integrated USB port, and it has all of the pins I need. I can connect all of the pins of my sensor modules directly to the Node MCU board using just header wires. There's no need to solder anything or to splice wires or anything like that. It's really easy. Okay, so let's talk about the sensor modules themselves. For the light sensor, there's a lot of choices. The most basic of these is to use a light dependent resistor or a photoresistor. These are really cheap and work really well. But in order to use it, you're going to have to use a resistor in series with it, which generally is going to involve some soldering, and that can be annoying since we're trying to do all of this with header wires, so that was out the door. Fortunately, you can buy a pre-assembled light-dependent resistor module for like a dollar and change. It comes pre-assembled and ready to use, and is super easy if you're trying just to run everything off of jumper wires. So those are great. You will see a couple of variants of those photoresistor modules that have four pins. The module we're trying to use has three pins on it. Voltage, ground, and analog out. That analog out gives you a readout of how much light is in the room. The four pin modules also include a digital pin, which is pulled high or low when a certain threshold of light is hit. If you buy a module that has the fourth pin, it should still work fine as long as it has that analog pin. Uh, just know that we won't use that digital pin with this sensor setup. Alternatively to all of that, you can use the more readily available TMET6000 light sensor. These use a transistor instead of a photoresistor and they're a lot smaller. They're also a little cheaper, at least compared to the photoresistor modules, and are more sensitive in low light conditions. The one downside, at least on the variant I bought, is that the pins don't come pre-soldered to the module board. It works fine, just pressure fitted together. But if you had a soldering iron, you could drop a little solder onto the ends of the pins it's just one last thing to break, so. Okay, so for the temperature and humidity sensor, I went with a DHT22 sensor. I've used these things forever, and they're really pretty reliable and accurate. Traditionally, to use a straight DHT22 sensor, you need to use a resistor in series with it again. However, for essentially the same price, you can buy a pre-assembled module that already has that resistor soldered in place, and then just to use a sensor, it's three pins again, voltage, ground, and signal, and they're really easy to use. The DHC22 sensor can monitor temperatures from negative 40 to 80 degrees Celsius, which I think is like 175 degrees Fahrenheit, with an accuracy of about half a degree. It can also monitor humidity levels from zero to 100% with like two to 5% accuracy. Next, the motion sensor. And mine, this is where the saga begins. From the beginning, I've always wanted to have a passive infrared motion detector on the sensor node. It lets you easily detect motion in a room, they're really low power, and supposedly very reliable. However, after I built my first version of the sensor node over a year ago, that PIR sensor has been nothing but trouble. The problem was that the sensor would just sporadically go nuts. 
Sometimes the sensor would detect motion every three seconds for like six hour intervals, or the sensor would be fine for like five hours and then you'd get a random motion event when nothing happened. Or sometimes the pin would just pull high and say motion detected and then nothing was happening. In my quest to resolve this and make the sensor 100% reliable, I did a lot of Googling. Some people said it was unstable power. Nope, it happened on batteries. It happened with decoupling capacitors. It happened when I ran the PIR sensor on a different power supply from the Node MCU chip. Some people said you could add an aluminum foil shield and block RF interference. Nope, that didn't do it. Some people said it was a bad ESP8266 chip. Nope, I tested every single all-in-one ESP board I could get my hands on with every permutation of PIR sensor and I always found the same thing. Every time I started getting close, the sensor would just sporadically freak out. I honestly thought I was going to crack and give up on this project. The damning day was when I had a PIR sensor hooked up to my ESP board on a really long header wire, and it was working great. Then randomly, I knocked the PIR sensor close to the ESP board, and bam, it started freaking out. And it turns out that, at least in every case I've tested here, that the RF interference from that ESP board causes huge problems. That led me to do some pretty specific Googling to find a PIR sensor that had some digital signal processing in it. And indeed, it exists. The AM312 PIR sensor. And man, when I found this thing, I knew I had finally made it. Not only is this sensor node pretty readily available, but it's one of the smallest PIR sensors I've found and works great. It's not adjustable, so you kind of have to take what you get here, but in my testing so far with this sensor node, it detects motion, no problem. As long as it continues to detect motion, it keeps the pin pulled high, and as soon as the motion stops, the pin goes low. It functions just like it should. So you're welcome to try any other PIR sensor you can find for your sensor node, but I will say that the AM312 PIR sensor is the only one I found that works reliably with the ESP8266 chips. The last part of the sensor node is a common cathode RGB LED. It has a shared ground, and lets you run voltage directly from the board into the LED, has a red, green, and blue channel, and you don't need any resistors or anything like that. The only modification you might need to make is to use some snips and cut down the pins on the LED just to make them a little shorter so it works easier with header wires. But otherwise, the common cathode RGB LEDs are really easy to work with. Wiring this beast up is really straightforward. Here's the wiring diagram. Like I stated earlier, everything is done with header wires, and every pin of your sensor module has a corresponding pin on the Node MCU board. Voltage goes to voltage, ground goes to ground, and your signal pins go to where they're defined in the code. It's worth noting that the VN pin is the only pin on the Node MCU board that supplies power directly from your power supply. So if you're using a five volt power supply, that pin will have five volts, but every other pin on your Node MCU board will be stepped down to 3.3 volts. And speaking of power supplies, I would recommend running your sensor node off of a 5 volt micro USB power supply that can provide more than half an amp. Generally, most old micro USB phone chargers will do the trick. Now, before we get the enclosure set up, it's a good idea to upload the code to your Node MCU board and make sure that your sensor is working correctly. To do this, you'll need to download the Arduino IDE and configure it to work with ESP8266 devices, as well as download a few libraries. I covered this in my earlier Sonoff video, but I'll reiterate it here really quickly in case you don't have it set up yet. The first thing we'll need to do is to download the Arduino IDE software. You can download this by going to the arduino.cc website. I prefer to use the portable version of the software, which you can download by clicking the Windows Zip for non-admin install link. Once the zip file is downloaded, you can extract it by right-clicking it and saying extract zip file. Windows can do this natively, or you can use your favorite zip utility. Once you have it unzipped, navigate inside of the folder until you can see the arduino.exe file. Then right click and create a new folder and name that folder portable. Next, open the Arduino software by clicking the arduino.exe file. Once opened, go to File, Preferences, and then in the Additional Board Managers URL field, paste the link that I have in the video description. This will allow you to download the firmware and files you'll need to flash an ESP8266 chip. Once you do that, go ahead and click OK. Now, we'll need to download those files. 
You can do this by going to Tools, Board, and then clicking Board Manager. In the window that pops up, type ESP8266 into the search box, and the ESP8266 board should pop up. Go ahead and click the Install button on the right-hand side of the window. Once that's finished, go ahead and click Close. Next, we'll need to download two libraries, which are dependencies for the Sonoff code. To do this, go to Sketch, Include Library, and then click Manage Libraries. In the search box, type PubSub, and you should see something pop up that says PubSub Client. Go ahead and click the Install button. Then in the search box, type JSON, and you should see the Arduino JSON library. Go ahead and click Install. Once you're done with that, go ahead and click Close. Now, the next thing we need to do is to change one of the files for the Arduino JSON library. To do this, go back to the Arduino folder and navigate inside of Portable, Sketchbook, Libraries, PubSub Client, SRC, and look for the pubsubclient.h file. To open this, right click and open it with a text editor. I'm using Notepad++, but you could just use the Windows default Notepad to edit this file. On line 26, you should see something that says pound defined MQTT max packet size 128. Go ahead and erase the 128 and replace that with 512. Then click save. Once you're done with that, you can close your text editor. Once you get the Arduino ID set up and all the relevant libraries installed, you can go ahead and copy the code off my GitHub repository for the sensor node and paste that into the Arduino IDE. You'll need to change the first few lines of code to add your Wi-Fi network and your MQTT broker. You can also change the sensor name and the MQTT topics. Just know that you'll have to have matching MQTT topics in your home automation hub configuration later on. Once you have everything entered into the code, you can hit the check mark in the top left of the Arduino IDE to verify that your code compiles. Once that completes successfully, you can go ahead and plug in your NodeMCU board to your computer with a micro USB cable. If you go to Tools and then Port, you should see a COM number light up once your NodeMCU board is detected and connected. Go ahead and click that COM port. Also, while you're there, go ahead and confirm that you're using the NodeMCU 1.0 board and if you're not, go ahead and select that from the list, that you're using a CPU frequency of 80 megahertz and an upload speed of 115,200. Once you have all of that entered correctly, go ahead and hit the arrow in the top left, and it'll upload the code to your NodeMCU board. Once it's finished uploading, it's a good idea to go to Tools and then Serial Monitor and open the Serial Monitor window. In the bottom right, select a baud rate of 115,200. It should begin displaying sensor data which means everything worked correctly and connected successfully. So now I'm gonna show you how to set up Home Assistant to see the data from your now functioning multi-sensor. If you didn't change any of the MQTT topics, you can just copy and paste my example configuration into your Home Assistant configuration file and it should just work. The multi-sensor has a few different parts inside of Home Assistant. First, you'll need to configure an MQTT JSON light to control the RGB LED. That looks like this. Next, you'll need to add an MQTT sensor for each sensor function of the multi-sensor. That should look something like this. And last but not least, you can use the groups component and link all of those different sensors and the RGB LED controller together and make a really pretty card for the front end of your Home Assistant user interface. After you do all of that, restart Home Assistant and you should be off and running. Okay, so now everything is functioning and working great. So to the last step, choosing an enclosure. I've definitely played around with ideas here, but it's far from perfect. I wanted to make something that looked halfway decent, so I designed a few things in 123D Design and then printed them out on my 3D printer. The enclosure that I finally landed on, I uploaded to Thingiverse and linked that below in the video description. I initially over-engineered the heck out of my enclosure, trying to put standoffs and cutouts and all of this but I eventually realized that everybody's 3D printer is a little different and all of those tolerances can get a little funky and you don't really need any of that. The sensor works great, just kind of wadded up. And as long as there's airflow to your temperature and humidity sensor and your PIR and light sensors are pointed the right way, that's basically all you need. So that's why the final version of my enclosure is basically just a box with some cutouts. It works though.
printing things is not your speed. I came across some really cool thermoplastic. You can even get some dyes for it and make it different colors and go crazy with it. Which melts just by putting it in boiling water. And then you can mold it with your hands into the shape that you want. And then you can just mold it around whatever object you want to make an enclosure for. To use it, I just wadded up my sensor and then took a sheet of it and just kind of wrapped it around it. It's not pretty, but it actually works surprisingly well. And this thermoplastic is really cool just to have around your house in general if you need to do anything with plastic and you don't have a 3D printer. It's basically just plastic Play-Doh. If you give it a shot, let me know. I'd love to see that as well. Now, I know a few of you are gonna ask, hey Ben, can you make this thing battery powered? And the short answer is, hypothetically, yes. But even with minimal polling frequencies, and using deep sleep and ditching the RGB LED, the battery still won't last that long. In general, Wi-Fi is just not a good protocol to use for batteries because it is so power hungry. For your wireless multi-sensor needs, I would definitely recommend checking out your Z-Wave options. Z-Wave in general is a lot better protocol to use with battery power devices because it uses a lot less power. Fabaro and Aotech both have solid battery powered multi-sensors that use Z-Wave. Both sensors detect temperature, light levels, motion, have like an intruder alarm, which is basically when they get shaked. The Aotech sensor also does humidity, the Favaro one doesn't. These are both really solid because they're really little and are easily mounted in the corner of a room. The battery life on these multi-sensors is solid. I don't think I've changed them in probably close to a year now. I'm going to do a full three-way comparison between these battery-powered multi-sensors and the DIY one that I just built. Until then, I will say that the DIY multi-sensor is way more sensitive and way more responsive compared to these Z-Wave sensors. That's primarily due to the fact it uses Wi-Fi, which is faster, and uses MQTT, which is really fast, and is powered, which lets it pull the sensors a lot more frequently. It's sensitive enough to detect humidity changes when you blow on it, or if you leave your monitor light on in a room. Anyway, more on that soon. So with that, I think that's all for this video. I put some links in the video description for all of the parts I used in this build. I tried to include some direct from China links and some Amazon links, just depending on your chill level for shipping. The code for the multi-sensor as well as my sample home assistant configuration is all on my GitHub page, so definitely check that out as well. If you build one of these, let me know. I'd love to know how it goes for you. As always, very much more to come. Have that sensor comparison video, a really cool power line monitoring device that I'm pumped to use. Uh, the DIY blinds project, Z-Wave switches, cameras, there's a lot to do. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss anything, and until then, happy automating.